So we're going to talk about something totally different today. Yesterday was configuration and the dependency injection container. So I thought, what's the exact opposite end of the spectrum that we could talk about today? We'll talk about JavaScript in the front end. So um, Webpack Encore is something that we released about a year ago. Um, I'm totally biased, but I think it's a great tool, and I hope that you guys are all using it. So we're going to talk a little bit about Webpack Encore itself, but what I really want to talk about are th some of the things that I've seen over the past year, uh, some, of the, some of the mistakes some people are making, some of the best practices that have, I think, developed after a year of using it, like recommendations um, that I think you should follow if you want to make your life a little bit easier. Um, damn, what, what, what? Got to turn it on. Got to turn it on. There we go. Um, I already talked about myself yesterday. But there's my kid again, so that's cool for me to put up. <laughs> he still looks cool. All right, so um, let's talk about uh, first a little bit about the tool itself. Um, I did a presentation last year that is actually all about uh, in depth, like what is Webpack, what is the, what is um, what is all this new development in the front end world, what is ES6. So if some of those things are still new to you, then you can go watch that presentation, or at the end, I have a link to our SymphonyCast tutorial so you can get in a more in-depth thing. So we're going to kind of go over some of the important things, but not as deep as some of those other places. So first of all, what is Webpack? You know, Webpack is an industry tool that, that pretty much everyone is using in this space. So when we wanted to help, when we wanted a solution for Symphony for how, how best to uh, package together our front end assets, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We wanted to use the same thing that everyone else was using. But it can be kind of a pain to use, especially if you're not building a single page app. So we built something on top of it to make it easy. But not reinventing the wheel, Webpack Encore is just a, a wrapper around Webpack. So what is Webpack? On a very superficial level, it's of course just a tool that packages your, your front-end application, your CSS and your JS, into a file. So here we have an app.js, and I'll talk about the require statements in a second. But you can actually require JavaScript files, you can require CSS files, and then you can do some things with them. And then ultimately, um, well, we'll talk about that in a second. Ultimately, oh, down here, this is going to output two files, an app.js and an app.css. So Webpack's going to look at this. It's going to go gather up all the JavaScript that you're using, all the CSS you're using, and it's going to dump the one JavaScript file and the one CSS file that you need to include on your page. And that's going to contain everything that you need. So you sort of don't need to worry about how it's all packaged together. But it's also, and this is something that, that is, really turns out to be the hard part with Webpack, it's also a totally different way of thinking about things. We've spent 15 years, something like that, uh, really getting used to JavaScript kind of sucking to develop with and it, it using lots of global variables. And probably to the point we've done it for so long with all this global variables that we don't even think about it anymore. We think about when I add this jQuery script tag to my page, I can just use a dollar sign variable. You can, because dollar sign is a global variable. With Webpack, all that global stuff goes out the window, and you get to, have to, start programming correctly. It's actually easier to do, but there's some untraining that needs to happen to do this stuff correctly. Um, so let's actually get uh, Webpack Encore installed. So Encore is a node library. Uh, but we actually have a recipe for it. We actually have a PHP package for it, which sounds a little bit confusing. Um, you can see me install it with composer require encore dash dash dev. What that really does is it just makes sure that you, you have the Symphony asset component because we use one small part of that. But really, the reason we have a, um, a PHP package for this is because we want a flex recipe to run. The real magic here is there's a flex recipe that runs that adds a couple of the files that you need. There's not really any PHP code behind the scenes to help Encore do itself, do anything. Yeah, so you can see it's configuring the Encore pack down there, that recipe. So that recipe gives you just very few things. Uh, it gives you this uh, package.json file, which lists your node dependencies. We'll look at that in a second. The Webpack configuration file. Uh, nice thing is, if you use Webpack by itself, that's the file that you need to have. So Encore is the same way. Again, we try to be as light of a wrapper as possible. And then we give you a, just a few files to get started, so an app.js and an app.css file. This is the package.json. Um, it's basically the composer.json of the node world. Uh, and we just have basically Webpack Encore. And then we also have one other package called Webpack Notifier, because then when you run your, your Webpack builds, you get this cool like operating system thing that comes down. It's like, your Webpack build finished. And it goes away. So we give you that out of the box so that there's like a little bit of like, wow factor. But you don't have to configure that. It just, it just works. 
And you also notice uh, these things called scripts. We don't really have that idea in uh, Composer, but as you'll see in a second, this is going to allow me to say um, uh, yarn. Yarn is the tool that I'm going to use to download my dependencies. I'll be able to say something like yarn encore dev, and it's going to know kind of like what to do behind the scenes. So we're kind of uh, setting up some shortcuts here so I can run my encore commands very easily. So those are kind of where those come from. Oh, and so this is the real important thing, the webpack.config.js. So if you want to learn about webpack, they're going to tell you to create this configuration file, and they're going to tell you to basically return a big uh, JSON structure that configures webpack. So all Encore really is is just a generator for that. So the only things we really need to tell it are where to put our files, uh, public slash build directory, and what our public path is to that, which of course will be just slash build since the public is the document root, and that's basically it. Then we need to give it something called an entry file. We basically said, go, this is, my entire JavaScript application starts right here. Almost, uh, and you'll see this in a second, I almost want you to think of that as your controller. Like in Symfony, we have our controller and everything starts there, and then we can start calling out to other services. It's the same thing, this is our controller, so go read this. And we're gonna call this entry app. These don't have to be the same name, app.js and app, they often are. This is the key thing, we have this thing called an entry called app. It's, like I said, it's sort of our controller. Uh, and that's it, so you get that for free. And uh, here's our app.js file. And I'm actually requiring an app.css file, which you can see down here, and I'm console.logging something. Cool? So uh, we actually need to download our dependencies, so we're gonna run yarn, well, yarn install is the command you usually run, but if you're like super lazy that day, you can actually run yarn, and yarn is a shortcut for just yarn install. So yarn is basically a composer. Um, and there's also another one in the node world, because of course, if you're gonna, if you, if you want to do something well, we should might as well do it twice. So if you've heard of NPM, NPM and Yarn do the exact same thing. You can use either one you want. You'll see us use Yarn all the time, but if you want to use NPM, great. So this would be NPM install if you want to use NPM. Makes no difference at all. So this, pow, just populates the node modules directory. So that's the vendor directory for node. So we now have a node modules directory full of a ton of stuff. Not that we really care, we don't have to look at it too much, but there, it populates that directory with a bunch of stuff. So now we're ready to go. So now finally we're gonna run yarn encore dev. And yes, there's a yarn, or, yarn encore production, you'll see that later, which is actually creates a more optimized build, you know, minifies the assets. But this would create our assets not minified, it's faster, you know, it's a little bit simpler. And then we also have dash dash watch, because we're going to want it to just watch our files for changes. So whenever we update something in one of our files, it's going to automatically dump out the new files. It's all the stuff you need in the build system, it just is there for you, so you didn't have to think about it. So this is what you're going to run when you start uh, developing. And what you're going to get is this structure here. It's going to dump, just like I mentioned before, it's going to dump, it's going to, uh, we pointed it at our app.js file. It parsed through the app.js file, figured out all the JavaScript we need, all the CSS we need, and dumped an app.css and an app.js. So for our application to run, both CSS and JS, we just need to create a link tag to the build slash app.css and a script tag to the build slash app.js, and that's all we need to think about. And we'll talk about these other two JSON files a little bit later, but they're not important right now. So um, I'm kind of going to put up some best practices here. And the first one is make your CSS, think of your CSS as a dependency of your JavaScript app. So that, that entry point thing we created, that said it's like a controller, I want you to think of that as your JavaScript app. And, and right now, the... Um, so notice I'm uh, including the app.css and the app.js in my layout file. The first thing I always do is I make one entry, which is like the, um, the entry that's for my entire kind of layout. So any JavaScript that I have that's part of my layout, like it's in my header, I want you to think of that as like a JavaScript app. It's my JavaScript app that kind of powers my, my layout. Uh, and even the CSS itself, including, like say if you have like bootstrap CSS, like I include that as a dependency of my app.js file. So my app.js would actually uh, require the bootstrap CSS, so it's a dependency of my app. So Webpack really wants you to kind of think like you're building a single page app. Uh, and even if you're not, that's a, it's a helpful thing to think about. Like my, 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 my application is uh, a JavaScript application that has CSS dependencies. So I'll talk more about that. But make your CSS a, a dependency of your JavaScript app. Require the stuff that you need. Um, and also, and you'll see we're going to go beyond this uh, in a little bit, but um, I want you to have one entry file. Um, so far, we only have one entry. That's that app entry, which you include on your layout. And this will have, like I said, the JavaScript and the CSS that you need for, for every, uh, you know, the common elements, the layout part of your elements for your site. 
Um, so, you know, like the reason that Webpack is actually important is the fact that, and you saw it earlier, we can actually require things. Uh, we don't longer have to say like, oh, let's include this script tag first because it creates a function in a globally named function and then let's use it in the next script tag. And if we forget to like, you know, put those in the right order or something, it all falls apart. We don't do that anymore. You just require what you need. So in this case, I'm still in my app.js. I've now said that I want to have a new function called get random word. Just like in a symphony controller, we could just inline that. We could just put that function right inside of our app.js, just like how we could put code right in our controller. You know, but at some point you're like, hold on, I want to isolate this because it's getting big and ugly, or I want to isolate this because I want to reuse it in multiple places. It's the exact same philosophy. Oh great, so we basically create this other function called randomword.js, and that's where that function lives. Now the key thing here, and it's a little bit different than, uh, than how it works in PHP, is that you actually need to export something from this file. So that's the module.exports equals. You could export a string if you wanted to, a function, an object, you can, uh, an array. You can export whatever you want, but it's the module.exports that defines what this thing exports. A little different than PHP where we just sort of just like make classes. And if you require that file, those classes are just kind of instantly available. You have to export them here. And then up there, that's what you use the require key for. So requiring uh, that module. Um, you'll notice the dot slash syntax. That's the syntax you use when you want to require something that is relative to your current file. And just to be extra lazy, I guess, you don't have to put the dot JS extension when you require things. You can. And when you're requiring a CSS file, you will. You'll say .css. But you know, if you see that, don't be confused. It's just for some reason the .js is optional. Um, you can put it on there if you want to. So the cool thing is I did nothing. I, 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 just, I just coded this, and it, it, I refreshed the page, and it works. Because we have, the, we have Encore still running with the dash dash watch. So Encore, really Webpack, reparsed our app.js, saw that we require another file, so it went and grabbed that stuff and it put it all inside of that final built app.js. So we just run around sort of coding correctly and Webpack just takes care of uh, making that final package for us. Um, or, of course, if you have one syntax for doing things, then you might as well have two syntaxes. It's not really fair. Uh, you'll see the require syntax, but you'll also see this other syntax, which is the import and export syntax. Long story short, require the require and module to export one is older, and then later they like standardized on a new official one um, that is the import and export. They basically both work. The import and export is the newer, more standard way, so it's the one you should use, but it actually doesn't make any difference behind the scenes. So you're just importing it, and there's an export. So it's just a different keyword, but they do the exact same thing. So again, when you see that, don't be confused. Just like there are two syntaxes to do it, I recommend the one that you see here. Same result, though. Um, so with this, you have like your, your entry file, the app.js. That's your controller. Cool? Then you start ex uh, uh, organizing your code into other smaller files. Those are called modules. That's just the name for them. When you have a, func uh, a file and it exports it something, like a, 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 a function or an object, that's known as a JavaScript module. And the best practice here is I want you to uh, organize your code into the re reusable modules and then basically use them from your entry file. That's your controller. So again, exactly the same way we do it in Symfony. Um, so actually, let's go like a, we'll kind of go like one level up here. So this is our app.js here. I'm now going to import some other module called display random word. Inside that module, I'm going to import another module called random word and use it inside of here. The details aren't that important of this. And then finally, well, there we go. Finally, this is our, hold on a second, I have a typo, don't I? Pop, 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 pop. Oh, no, I don't. Yeah, app.js. Basically, app.js is, is importing one module. That module is importing another module. Just an example of, like, again, exactly what we do in Symfony. We might use one service. That service might use four other services. Um, every module is concerned about getting what it needs. So if a module needs access to some other module, then we import it. So if you kind of zoom in, every single file here is completely standalone. If it needs something, it's importing it. It's not assuming it's going to magically exist some way. Like It's like, I need this function, so I'm going to go import uh, the module that gives me that function. Um, so on the previous thing, if you kind of look at what this does, this is just a funny way to basically get a random word and then display it on some element. 
So if you actually execute this, it's, it's basically putting a random word onto some HTML element. OK, so the whole, that's the whole job of this display random word um, uh, module here, is actually to write some HTML onto something. So now we're like, OK, that's cool. But um, the display random word module here, it actually wants to add some CSS. It actually wants to, the, its job is actually going to be to uh, print out a random word. But it wants the random word to be like bold or something. So you actually have a situation where your JavaScript suddenly actually, uh, is sort of, sort of dependent on some, C, on some CSS, because the, it's actually going to um, output some markup. That markup's going to have some CSS classes. So it kind of needs some CSS file to be brought in at the same time. So there are two ways to solve this. One is that. Remember, we already have a CSS file right now. We have one CSS file in our applications, our app.css, which probably, can, probably holds like the, all the CSS that's needed for our layout. And that's the point of it. And we're in, importing it from our app.js file. So of course, one thing we could do is, if assuming that function added some like lucky word CSS class, we already have a CSS file. So we could just run in there, and we could add it. This is not the best way to do it. A better way to do it is to create a new lucky word.css file and then import it from the actual module that needs that. So even your CSS is going to be broken down into small pieces. And so this module is truly importing everything it needs. It's importing outside JavaScript it needs. But it's also making sure that outside CSS files are brought in. But the end result of this is exactly the same. Webpack is going to load the app.js file. That's going to load some <laughs> other module. It's going to notice that module needs another CSS file. Ultimately, at the end of this, though, there's still just an app.js and an app.css being export. It's just that we're organizing our code a little bit better. But Webpack is figuring out all the stuff you need and crawling through all your dependencies and finally packaging those two files. <laughs> So the best practice here is like really think of each module as its own unique snowflake. Each module should require every little thing it needs, uh, import its own dependencies. It should, really should be a standalone thing. And obviously, one, you know, one other reason to do that is that this, um, this module now could be reused on other pages. We could like just require this. Anytime we need this functionality on some other page, we can require this module, and it's going to bring the JavaScript and the CSS that it needs with it. We don't have to like be like, hmm, are we including the correct CSS uh, file on this page also to make this styled correctly? Um, another thing that uh, kind of goes with uh, these dependencies are that you don't need to think about is that Webpack is also going to bring in like font files or image files. So if our CSS file, our lucky word.css, suddenly references a font file that's in some fonts directory, we don't need to worry about uh, how that's all going to be packaged together. Um, so it made, sense, it made sense before when Webpack saw a CSS file. Um, sorry, when Webpack saw a JavaScript file that required a CSS file, it makes sense that it would kind of get that CSS and put it in the final packaged app.css. It sort of does the same thing for font files or background images. In this case, it's going to see that font file there. And what it's going to do is it's going to copy that font file, I believe I have this here, yep, into our build slash fonts directory. And in the app.css, it's actually going to rewrite the path in there to be the correct path to it. So in your CSS files, you just make background images, you just reference font files, you point at wherever they live on your file system, and then Webpack's going to make sure that it puts those in the final right place. So again, the font file is really a dependency of your CSS file. So you put it in there, and it's going to take care of moving it for you. All right, so cool story, but I'm not building a single page app, because so far we've just had like one app uh, entry, you know, and we included on our layout. Um, that's great if you have that, but if you have multiple pages, it's very common to have um, page-specific JavaScript and CSS. So you go, oh, we have a checkout page, and it's, its, own, it's got its own JavaScript. And yes, we can include all that stuff in our app.js and our app.css, but you know, at some point you're like, it only need, it's only needed on this one page. Great, so we're going to create a new file, a new entry file. So think of like a new controller uh, called checkout.js. And this is going to be responsible for, ex for running all of the JavaScript and all the CSS that's specific to our checkout page. Okay, so again, think of your, this as a standalone JavaScript application that runs everything on our checkout page. We're then going to add a second entry. So basically a second controller. Point it at that checkout.js file. The end result is it's going to dump a checkout.js and a checkout.css. All the JavaScript and all the CSS that it finds as it crawls through that path is going to end up uh, output here. 
And then on our checkout that HTML that twig, we're gonna do the kind of the same thing we always did. We're gonna override the style sheets block, override the JavaScript block, and we just need to make sure we have a link tag and a script tag for those two new things. Once we do that, we can happily go into our checkout.js file, require other modules, make those modules require other CSS files. It's all just gonna keep automatically building behind the scenes, and it's gonna make sure that those files have everything they need in them. Um, so this is, and you're gonna see in a second how this, why this one's important and how it's kind of falling apart. Each entry, you should have one entry per page. The layout is sort of the exception. Think of like your layout as its own page. Um, so if you think of your layout as its own page, you have one entry per page that you actually need custom JavaScript and CSS. And each uh, entry or page is a standalone JavaScript app. Again, almost pretend like that checkout.js is a single page application. It handles everything that needs to happen that's JavaScript or CSS related on the checkout page. They don't leak. I don't want them to, I don't want to start thinking, I'm going to do something in my app.js and that's gonna like make a global function or something available that I can then use later in my checkout.js. Those are two separate applications. Yes, they are gonna be both included on the same page, but pretend like they aren't. Pretend like you're gonna have just the checkout.js file on your page and the app.js is not even gonna exist at all. If you start crossing those, that's where things get kind of funky. And that's what we're gonna talk about. jQuery, it turns out, is a particularly uh, easy thing to make your whole asset uh, setup get, get super funky. Um, so jQuery, where things fall apart. Um, it's not really jQuery's problem, it's just it's the way jQuery works. It, 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 um, it's actually kind of tricky to think about. All right, so you want jQuery, no problem. Um, here's the, again, great thing about working with Webpack. You want jQuery? Yarn add jQuery dash dash dev. That puts it into the node modules directory, it adds it to your package.json file. So you now have jQuery sitting in your, in your vendor directory, in your node modules directory. You wanna use it? Great, import dollar sign from jQuery. So when you don't have the dot slash in front, um, it knows that you want this, you're, you mean like the jQuery uh, uh, package that you installed. So dot slash means it's a local file sitting right here or dot dot slash. Without that, it's like this is the, the, the package that I downloaded. So go get me jQuery and uh, now we use stuff. Boom, that's awesome. That's, it wasn't hard to use jQuery before, but it's just super easy and it's actually, um, you know, the version is even stored in your package.json file. You can upgrade it if you want. So, well, of course, this seems obvious, but you'll see how things get messed up. Require jQuery like any other module, or you know, React, whatever you're using. It's not special, it's just a, it's a variable you need. Uh, so like everywhere else, if you need a variable, um, then require the thing that gives you that first, require the module that gives you that variable. So what's the difference? Ah, this is where things really get super important. Like I think most of our like issue reports or questions are centered around the difference between these two things. Turns out there's a huge difference between those two things. Yeah, I'm getting like a nod in the audience, like an amen. <laughs> so this is uh, a simplification, but if you looked inside the jQuery.js file, you're gonna see something that looks like this. And pretty much every um, JavaScript library that's it has been updated in the past four years, unless it's a really, really old library, is gonna have something that basically looks like this. And what it's gonna do internally is it's literally checking to see if it is in a Webpack or Webpack-esque environment. So it's checking to see if module.exports is basically a thing. If it is, it basically exports the jQuery variable. If it's not, it makes it a global variable. So the window object is the global variable in your browser. So if you ever say window.foo equals bar, you actually have a global foo variable. So this makes two global variables. So the same file behaves completely differently when you require it versus put it in your browser. And this means when you import or require the jQuery module in, uh, from one of your other modules, there is no global variable being created. There is no globals ever created. And this is the same thing even with your modules. If you create a module called get random word, that's great, good for you. You're exporting that value. You are not creating a global function. So don't expect, uh, yeah, I think people, it makes sense. People treat it a little bit more like, um, a little bit more like uh, PHP. You kind of say, oh, if I require this file over here, regardless of what it exports, I, I created a function in there called foo. So I should be able to over here, right after I require it, just start using the foo function. Nope, 
your whole module is basically wrapped in this, uh, it's basically a self-executing block. It's wrapped in this thing to isolate it. And the only thing that leaks out is what you export. All those other things do not become global functions. So uh, our stuff works like jQuery does, basically. Um, so again, almost all JavaScript libraries work like that. So let's see here. So uh, in app.js, um, we're going to, let's go, this, is the, this is what people, this is the tricky thing. In app.js, we're going to import dollar sign from jQuery. And remember, app.js is included on every page. And checkout is also included on that one specific page. So if you're on the checkout page, if you look at the HTML source, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see these back to back next to each other. So now in checkout.js, I'm going to use jQuery without importing it. Is that going to work? Yeah, it's like, mm, like maybe. No, that's not going to work. There is no dollar sign variable down here. The dollar sign variable was returned as a local variable in some other file, but it does not mean that it was glo it's globally instantly available. That was the old way of doing things, but there is no global variable set, so that's not going to work. Which is great. It means, I mean, it, if you back up, you're like, you should be thinking, of course that's not going to work. No one ever set a dollar sign variable inside of checkout.js. There's no other time where we'd suddenly expect a variable just to exist. So it's again, it's like untraining, being like dollar sign variable is undefined in checkout.js. No one ever set that. You need to add the import above this to make sure that's set. So yeah, you're going to reference error, dollar sign is not defined. Here's a very similar thing. Um, uh, same exact setup. Now I'm going to try to call dollar sign from inside of my template. Same thing, not going to work. There's no global variables. And this is a particular tricky thing because, um, and I was the same way too, we're all, well, not all, many of us who have been around for a while, we were used to at least putting some of our JavaScript in our template. We're like, we tried to put in external JavaScript, but when push came to shove, we ultimately did some stuff in our template. With Webpack, you can't do that. There's no, the global variable was never created. Yes, there's a way to cheat, don't do it. However, it is convenient if you have legacy applications. So you can check out our screencast on it. We basically say, look, if you have all these templates that are still referencing jQuery, here's the way you can cheat, but you shouldn't. And for understanding how Webpack works, I want you to think there's never a global variable, so that will never work. Okay, so jQuery plugins are really where things get weirder. Um, because so far, it's almost just a cautionary tale. Don't expect jQuery to magically exist. Import it whenever, in every module that you need it in. Great. So now we're going to import dollar sign from jQuery, and then we're going to import Bootstrap. So I, up here, I, I actually installed Bootstrap, so that's great. Uh, and by Bootstrap here, of course, Bootstrap has CSS, but Bootstrap also has JavaScript. So I'm specifically talking about importing the Bootstrap JavaScript. So this is weird, because this is the first time we had an import that's not returning anything. That's the weird thing about jQuery plugins. jQuery plugins don't export anything, even if they're written correctly. Because they, their whole point, the way that the plugin system was built originally, is that their whole point is that they actually modify the jQuery object. They add something to it. So how does that work internally? So this ends up being a, a, a key thing. Because if you think about it, Actually, I'll go back here. How does Bootstrap know which jQuery object to modify internally? Historically, it's done, the way it's done, and that's actually the else down here. So this is if you looked inside the bootstrap.js file, you'd see something like this. Historically, Bootstrap, and I think this is actually true in Bootstrap 3, it, uh, it checked to see if there's a global jQuery object. And if there wasn't, it, it failed. That's the Because it doesn't know. Like, it's just like somebody's using me. I need to modify jQuery. I don't even know where I am right now. I need to find jQuery somehow. So it would look on for a global jQuery object, and if it didn't exist, it would bail. It would, it would die. In Bootstrap 4, it's a little bit smarter. And again, it just checks to see if, what type of environment it's in. So it's basically looking to see um, if it is in a Webpack-esque environment. If it's in a Webpack-esque environment, it does the right thing. Internally, it actually requires jQuery. So it's uh, one of the properties of the uh, module system is that if, if you require jQuery five different times, you're getting the same object back every time. You're not getting back like five different jQuery objects. So it happens to require the same jQuery that we're using. And so when it modifies it, it modifies the same jQuery object that we're using afterwards. So it's super implicit. It's hard to kind of know what's going on because it's all kind of hidden behind the scenes. 
Um, so actually, let me go back here real quick. Pop, pop, pop. So this would actually work here, only because Bootstrap happens to be modifying that same dollar sign variable that we're using above. Okay, but it's not very obvious. And if you get tooltip not defined, it's hard to figure out like why is tooltip not defined. Um, unfortunately, uh, I just gave you an example of a Bootstrap plugin that is written correctly. Not all Bootstrap plugins are written correctly. Uh, here's an example. Um, it's fortunately getting harder and harder to find these. Um, but Jake, yarn add jQuery tags input. So it's a little input thing. You, you know, type something and hit tab. It turns it into a cute little uh, tag looking thing. Um, so great. So this is, a, this is a really good start here. So I'm going to import dollar sign from jQuery. I'm going to import the plugin, which ideally modifies the jQuery object. And hey, this uh, plugin also needs a CSS file. So let's import the CSS file as well. So great example of, of pulling in everything that you need. Fortunately, that doesn't work. Um, oh, by the way, yes, I'm glad I, I'm glad my green thing just told me that. Um, normally, if you import things from the node modules directory, you just say the name of the, the thing. But sometimes you actually want a specific like CSS file in there or something, and you can absolutely do that. So this is actually short for node modules slash jQuery tags input slash dist slash blah, 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 CSS. It's really, really common when you need to bring in the CSS from a JavaScript module. Um, this is not going to work. Boo. Um, because, oh, actually, there we go. The error is really important here. Uh, jQuery is not defined, and it's coming from inside of that plugin itself. You guys can probably guess what's happening. It's, uh, it's, it's just expecting there to be a global object. There's nothing in there that looks for I'm um, in a Webpack environment. It just like right on one line is like, jQuery, do this. And it's like, I hope you're here. You know? So it just, it just uses jQuery out of the global. Uh, and, it's, and if it's not there, then, then tough. Okay? So this actually, so far, means this is not something we can use. This is not something that is compatible with the Webpack system at all. It's just written incorrectly. So we have a fix for that. Uh, it's actually, this is a feature from Webpack, and we, we wrap it. This is where things uh, get great, because you can now use this plugin, but where it, gets, it becomes a really slippery slope, because it allows you to cheat in lots of different ways. So what you do is you call, you add this function called auto provide jQuery. What that does is it actually makes this change. Sorry, that's a little low. It makes this change to the, um, well, actually, let me back up here. So literally, when it opens that jQuery that tags that input file, it rewrites its code and corrects it. It takes off this minus jQuery thing and replaces it with require jQuery.fn.tags input. It's that smart. It actually is looking everywhere for any undefined, undeclared variables called jQuery and replacing them with require jQuery. The plugin behind this is called the provide plugin in um, uh, Webpack. So you can actually do this with other variables too. Uh, it's so common with uh, jQuery that that's why we add this auto provide jQuery. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy that it can do that. It's wonderful that it can do that because it helps us out. But it's also very confusing. Um, it, can, it can confuse some things behind the scenes. So brilliant, we fixed the bad code, which means now we can write bad code. Yay! Everything I told you up till now is a lie because we can just open up, check out that JS file and just, just start referencing a dollar sign without doing anything. Because Webpack rewrites our crappy code now. Yay! And you can see, if you don't really understand what's going on, all of a sudden, it, it, like it, it, you're like, you don't really understand Webpack anymore. And you're pretty sure that jQuery is still creating global objects. And, and you don't really uh, get into this whole idea of variables aren't magically available. You need to import them because it allows you to cheat, basically. Um, so not that you shouldn't use it, but it kind of opens this door where it gets easier to kind of not know what's going on. This still does not work, though. It's still not that jQuery was created as a global variable. It's just that any code that's parsed through Webpack, which is not te random template code, is going to be rewritten to be correct. But this is a twig template here, so this is still not going to be like rewritten. There is no dollar sign global variable. Again, there is a way to make a true global variable with jQuery. We document it, um, but I don't want you to do it unless you have a legacy code. Um, so this is a best practice that's a duplicate from earlier, which is please treat each entry, uh, each page as a standalone JavaScript app even though uh, the auto-provide jQuery kind of allows you to cheat specifically with jQuery. Try to keep that thing in mind that every entry is its own JavaScript application. And every module is its really own uh, delicate uh, flower as well that should uh, import whatever it needs. So, um, because what I'm seeing is people doing this. 
people are basically taking their old script tag system and they're converting it to this. Remember, every entry should be its own individual JavaScript application, but they're treating it more like they did before. They're like, well, we just need to make sure our shared is there because it adds a bunch of global functions, and then our vendor is there, and our jQuery tag plugin is there. Um, so they just convert it to this. And I don't want you to do this. And it's actually very difficult to get this working. It's possible to get this working, but it's very difficult. Um, if we require, you know, the vendor here is going to bring in jQuery. If you have the auto provide jQuery installed, then you actually can magically just include the jQuery tags input and it will be rewritten correctly. Um, so you can kind of get this to actually work. Uh, but what you're trying to do is basically have every entry file set a bunch of global stuff or something like global stuff so that down here you can reference that global stuff. Um, so it's kind of the old pattern of doing things. So every entry is a page, an own standalone application. Don't do this stuff. Oh, and side note, uh, I created it. But the add style entry thing, that's a total hack. You shouldn't use that. Um, we, knew, we knew when we went to this, because it's a big change in how you think that some people would be like, I just want to like, uh, like minify a CSS file. So you can do that with add style entry. Um, but really, you should be, you know, this layout.css, that should probably be uh, imported from your app.css, whatever your like one, uh, sorry, app.js file, whatever your one JavaScript file is that you include on your entire layout, that should be including the CSS for like your header, footer, that kind of stuff. Don't just create a random CSS file. Um, so the last thing we need to talk about, and this is actually going to be talking about some new things that are going to be coming uh, very soon, whenever I actually go on GitHub and more or less hit like tag release is um, a thing called code splitting. So, so far, Webpack's all like, yo, dude, uh, just you know, like, do your thing, code correctly, and I'll take care of the rest. Don't worry about it. I'm going to make sure that the final files have exactly the stuff they need. You don't have to think about it. And that really is the philosophy that I want you to have. Except, of course, now I'm going to give you like, one exception of where you need to think about how to optimize the build. Um, so if we right now, we can run yarn on core production. That would give you the minified build. Uh, that's actually going to create an app.js file and a checkout.js file that are both pretty huge, 193 kilobytes. And the reason, basically, is that um, jQuery is inside of each of those, which makes sense. We require jQuery, or you know, the same thing would be for React. If we required React from both of our entry files because they're both React apps, well, it's going to create an app.js and a checkout.js file that both have React in them because they both need it. And remember, app.js and checkout.js are standalone JavaScript applications. So from a, like a, a purely like coding standpoint, this makes perfect sense. It's just not efficient. So the way that we have solved this up until now is to take your one entry, that is the entry that's included in your layout, whatever you call it, and you change it to create shared entry, from add entry to create shared entry. Again, this is leveraging a feature inside of Webpack called the Commons Chunk plugin, which is super confusing to how to use. Uh, but in, in Encore, we just have to do this. Um, the end result of this is very simple. Anything that is, anything, any JavaScript that has included in app.js will not be repeated in any other final entry files. And it sort of makes sense. We're, we're telling Webpack app.js will be included on the layout. It will be included on every page. So it's not necessary to repackage React in checkout.js, because it's already right here in app.js, and that will be included on every page. It's the same thing's true with the CSS. Anything that was in, that's included in app.css would not be repeated in any of the page-specific CSS files. So not, it's not a super hard thing. It's just something you kind of got to teach what it means, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but that's kind of the solution. Um, except that that idea is dead. <laughs> Talk to me later. Well, it's not dead because we still support it. But Webpack 4 killed this. The Commons Chunk plugin is what, um, is what powered this. And the Commons Chunk plugin is, well, at least at last check, not supported in Webpack 4 and on purpose because there's another way to solve this. Um, so we're going to actually we're gonna go back. We're going to go backwards to, um, well, no, 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 this is still forward. I thought I went backwards here. Well, OK, actually, I'm just saying that we, we still, and so Webpack 4 came out actually a while ago in sort of January, earlier this year. Um, the next version of Encore, whenever I kind of hit the tag button, will support Webpack 4. We're not even support it, it will force Webpack 4. So right now, if you use Encore, you're in Webpack 3, you're about to be upgraded to Webpack 4 and then that next version of Encore. Um, in, like I said, in Webpack 4, the shared entry thing doesn't make any sense. We still support it in Encore. 
Um, we kind of had to do a hack to get it to work, but it still totally works and it works well. It's just now, with all, everything with Encore, we're trying to like just make it easier to work with Webpack, not work against Webpack or reinvent the wheel. So if Webpack comes and says, this is now the proper way to do something, we want to do it the proper way and follow the industry, not become like weirder and weirder and weirder. So we still support that. We'll probably deprecate it someday, but it's still supported. So now what do we do? If that's not the uh, cool hipster way of doing things anymore, what is? So introducing Webpack Encore, <laughs> introducing Webpack Encore 0 0.21. This is the big release here. That's the one that's going to support Webpack 4. Yes, at some point I probably need to properly make a 1.0. Um, that's on me. Um, you know, it's just we're, I'm in the Node world with this library, so everyone else just does 0. something. So I wanted to I wanted to fit in. Um, so the big differences with 0 0.21, Webpack 4 support, that's the biggest thing. And almost everything under here is going to be just kind of a byproduct of that. And for the most part, you're, you don't care. If you don't really want to get into all this Webpack stuff, you're probably not really going to care that much about this release, uh, the specifics of this release, except for a couple of small things that I'll show. Um, I'll talk about the runtime chunk. I'll talk about the split chunks. That's, that's the efficiency thing. A um, couple nice things that I won't talk about that are, are kind of nice is um, browser list support and package.json. Uh, it's actually a little key you can put in your package.json file that describes what browsers you, your application needs to support. And then um, when your CSS and JavaScript is uh, is, is uh, uh, built, uh, it'll actually be sort of rewritten to support those browsers, but, but not other browsers. So um, a simple version of this is like, you know, auto, the auto prefixing in CSS. You know, if you want to do like rounded corners or something like that, you know, if you like need to support super old browsers, then you need that CSS to be rewritten into kind of a crazy way. But if you need to support more modern browsers, you don't need all that extra stuff. So the browser list is what you can use and like everything else just sort of reads it automatically. So that was a cool thing. We were actually waiting on something in the Node world to full, fully implement that. And finally, it does. And our new version gets that for free. Uh, I'm going to show the code splitting thing as well. And smarter version checking system. This is cool because there's so many features in uh, Webpack that are op or in Encore that are optional. And so we just tell you, hey, like if you try to like enable a feature, like enable React support. If you want React in an Encore app, you just go dot enable React support or dot enable, dot enable React preset. As soon as you do that, you're going to get an error. It's going to tell you to like that you need to install like two libraries that actually give you React support. So we don't we don't give you everything out of the box, but if you need something, we just tell you what command to run. But we were running into some subtle problems where like a new version of that library we told you to get would be released. It may or may not work with Encore, and so you might start getting like weird conflicts because Encore only worked with the older one or only worked with the newer one, and yours is outdated. Um, so we actually get nice warnings now to say, hey, you're using a version of this library. It may or may it may work, but just as a warning, like the, your version of Encore is, is not tested with it. So, um, you know, so then you, you know, use it at your own risk, downgrade, upgrade, um, or whatever. Uh, and then Babel 7 out of the box. If you care about that, you know what that means. If you don't, then it's not that big of a deal. So real quick, runtime chunk is not a feature. This is something I want you guys to know about. Um, if, so if you have more than one entry, so you have a multi-page app, you should probably use a runtime chunk. What that's going to look like is when you, upgrade, when you upgrade to the new version of Encore, you're actually going to get a deprecation warning that says you, you should either go into your Webpack config and, and call enable single runtime chunk or disable single runtime check. If you say disable, um, then, then you don't really need to change anything. But if you say enable, then it's actually going to start dumping out a new runtime.js file, which you need to include in your layout before your first JavaScript file. It's kind of an annoying little detail. Why do we have that? We have that because um, when you have a runtime chunk, if you enable it, then if you have multiple entries, and those multiple entries require the same module, like jQuery, they'll get the exact same object back. If you don't have a runtime chunk, they truly are like separate applications. Um, uh, so if, if uh, your app.js requires jQuery, and then you require Bootstrap, which adds a bunch of functions to your jQuery, and then over here in checkout.js, you require jQuery, you don't have those Bootstrap functions available. It actually, it's not, it's not about an efficiency of downloading. You still might have an efficient build where it only packaged jQuery once, but it actually creates two different jQuery objects for your application so that they're totally separate from each other. That's actually a good thing technically. But I think for a lot of users, uh, it can be surprising. You know, because when you, go, when you go to this new version from the old version, um, the old version, if you require jQuery from two different entries, you got the same object. So enabling basically gives you the same behavior you had before. In a super perfect setup, you actually wouldn't need that functionality because you'd be re truly writing your uh, entry files um, to be totally separate. You know, if you needed Bootstrap over here, you'd require jQuery, then Bootstrap. 
So anyways, that's what that is. Uh, it's more I want you guys to know about that because it's a thing that's going to come up and I, I want it's a kind of an annoying, confusing thing. I want you guys to understand it. Oh yeah, this is what I was just talking about here. Um, if you have the runtime chunk, then this will work. You require jQuery up there, you require Bootstrap, and then in your other entry file, you actually do have the tooltip function from Bootstrap, even though you didn't require Bootstrap down in checkout.js. Again, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Kind of maybe not the feature you want, but um, when you're upgrading, uh, if you require the runtime chunk, it's gonna, it's gonna work nicely. All right, cool. So we gotta go back. We originally came down this because we were talking about optimizing our build. Because we still have like we still have jQuery like, multiple times, or we still have React multiple times, and uh, and that's not cool. So we're actually gonna go back from create shared entry to add entry. I actually like this. I never. And this means in the new version of Encore, we don't have to teach anybody about the shared entry thing. You say one entry per page, you know, and then one entry per your layout. And that's it. Cool. So we went back to what we had before. Um, then we're gonna add this split entry chunks. Okay. Well, very, a very strange thing is going to happen when we do this. A very magical thing. And that's when we run yarn encore production. You'll see down here it has information about your entry point. It says, hey, I dumped one entry point called app, and I dumped another entry point called checkout. Then check out all these files here. There's one JavaScript file, two JavaScript files. There's a CSS file, JavaScript file, JavaScript file. It's actually telling you in order to run the app uh, entry, you now need four script tags on your page. What's happening here is, and you can control this, this is a Webpack feature. Webpack actually has a built-in thing that, uh, a kind of an algorithm that looks at all of your entries and looks at all the different modules they, they imported uh, and basically tries to optimize them. It's like, okay, um, you know, this is being shared in these two places, but not these other three places, so let's isolate this into its own file. And it has rules to like isolate stuff into smaller pieces, but it realizes that there's a penalty for additional web requests, so it doesn't go crazy with this. It tries to balance like smaller files that are reusable between your entries versus having so many web requests. So I don't know exactly what's inside this JavaScript file here, but like this is probably jQuery. And you see that the vendor A3 is also going to be included on your checkout page. So when you go to your checkout page, people have already, already downloaded runtime.js and this vendor.js, which probably includes jQuery. And so now all they have to do is download basically the checkout.js, which is just going to be a very, very small file. So of course the problem is that we now need this inside of our uh, tweak template. In this case, this is our base layout. We would need all four of these script tags in order to get our application to run. And even more fun is that this might become five tomorrow, or the, uh, the little file names on these might change. This is the, kind of the point of it. Like uh, Webpack's like, I'm going to take care of splitting this up in an efficient way. You can configure that process if you have some special rules, but basically I'm going to take care of it for you. So unfortunately, unfortunately, we had to create a new feature. Uh, try to be as, like, a, as hands off as we can with uh, Webpack. But you know, this whole thing, this whole thing works really, really great if you have a single page application where you literally have like an index.html. You know, if you're, if you're talking to a, a Symfony app, it could be a completely different server. You just have an index.html over here. Because the way that Webpack's, Webpack's gonna tell you to implement this is they're gonna tell you to enable this special plugin that literally like on build modifies your index.html and like physically writes out the script tags you need. Works super great if you're deploying an index.html file to your server. Does not work super great when you have a more dynamic multi-page system because we, we can't just have it like modify our twig templates during build or something like that. Um, so we created or are about to create, it's, it's not, uh, there's not a, a, a tagged release yet. When we release a new version of Webpack Encore, we'll also release the first version of this. It's very simple. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Uh, my, my wife put that in and I forgot about it. <laughs> so I, I was just as surprised as you guys. Just thanks for participating. Um, so we'll compose, you know, you can compose a require Symfony slash Webpack Encore bundle, but really it's going to be included in the Encore pack. So you remember in the beginning we said compose require Encore? So in the future, when you, did, when you do that, you'll get this bundle as well. And it's actually pretty cool because now you just say Encore entry link tags and you put the name of your entry file. And that's going to print out all two or three CSS files you need, and same thing for the JavaScript here, and it's gonna print out all three or four JavaScript files that you need. So now it's actually less work than it was before, because you just go to a page and say Encore Entry Script Tags, the, na the name of your entry, and that's it. Um, same thing, check out that HTML twig, so just, down these, just these two things, and it'll kind of figure it out behind the scenes. Um, 
the way this works behind the scenes is Webpack is dumping an entry points.json file. That file name might change, but it doesn't matter to you guys. Uh, the reason it might change, really fun thing, is we implement, uh, we dump this file uh, via code in our library, and that's because there was no um, node module, we could, no pl node plugin, uh, node library we could find that did this uh, already, and there finally is one. So this is actually a really nice thing. Before we release this, we'll probably rip out this code, and we'll be able to use uh, community code instead of having uh, stuff in ours. So that's, that's what, always what we want to do with Encore, is to be using the same tools that everyone else in the Webpack world is using. So anyways, this might change slightly, but you guys get the idea. You can see the app entry. It lists all the JavaScript files, it lists all the CSS files. So this is something that's built automatically for you. Um, by the way, this, this system here, and it was, this, is, this was true before this existed, but it was done in a slightly different way. This is also going to enable free versioning support. So I don't show it here, but uh, normally when you do your Yarn run, uh, Yarn uh, Encore production, all of your file names uh, are versioned. You can kind of see it here, but it would actually happen with like your checkout.js and your checkout.css. But you don't have to worry about that because the entry points.json contains the uh, version file name. It's a hash of the contents, and so pff, your templates just use it. Uh, same is true with uh, C if you have a CDN. There's just a little spot in your Webpack configuration file where you can say, I use this CDN. And now all of these uh, values here would basically have your full URL to your CDN. So it would just point over to your CDN. So it's really, really nice to have, have your uh, kind of twig, this bundle kind of taking care of things for you, because it's more than just this feature. It's all these other nice features, too. Um, so yeah, that's it. So it's, there's going to be a slightly different way to include things in the next version of Webpack Encore. It's going to be really great, but you know, tell your friends, because it's kind of a new thing that we have to kind of uh, teach the community and, and explain why this is done this way and the benefits of doing it. There's last, one, one last little tiny thing I want to talk about. It's sort of not a new feature in the new version of Webpack, but we made it much easier to do. It's called dynamic code splitting. And this is actually a spot where you are doing something, and um, you are going to require a module. But then you go, wait a second. The user only needs this functionality once they like, click this button. And not everyone clicks this button. So I don't want to like, require React over here and, and have that put into my final JavaScript file if most users aren't even going to need it. I'd rather like them click the button and then grab React via Ajax right at that moment, or you know, whatever, whatever the stuff is, whatever the big thing is that you have. You know, give them a little loading animation, and then it, it loads, and then, and, then, and then you just kind of keep going. So that's called dynamic code splitting. And uh, it looks like this. So you have your app.js on top. And here's, I'm adding, I'm using jQuery, so it's nice and simple. Uh, an on click of some link tag with an external class, we're going to uh, run a function. This is exactly what I'm talking about. You know, we could just, inside, of, um, Assuming what we're doing could be quite heavy, could be like requiring lots of outside libraries. So what I could have done is, you see I'm using this common external checker module that I just invented. We could have just put it on top. We could have just put that on top of that file, import uh, linker from external linker. Great. But then the external linker and all of its dependencies would be included in our final app.js file. So instead, you use import like a function. So normally it's like import you know, this from this. It's not a function. You use it like a function, you give it the uh, same path that you always need, and then you say dot then, because this returns a promise. If you know what promises are, then you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna know what I'm talking about. Um, um, even if you don't, you probably use them for like Ajax and things. So dot then, and then our function is called once that uh, finishes downloading. I'm using the arrow syntax, a newer syntax in JavaScript, but that's just a callback function. So um, what I don't show here is like a loading animation. Um, but you would actually, right above the import line, you'd probably like start some loading animation. And then inside of your callback, you'd stop the loading animation. Okay, so it's exactly like, JavaScript, or like Ajax, right? Start my loading animation, do my Ajax, and when the Ajax finishes, stop my loading animation. So it's the same thing. And then there's my external thing down here, and it, has, it includes jQuery. It even includes a CSS file, right? Because we write our modules correctly, and they import the stuff that they need to. So behind the scenes, um, the important thing is that external linker.js and its CSS will not be included in the app.js or the app.css. Instead, it's going to be loaded via Ajax the minute that we hit that. And it just works really great. You'll actually see when you do your build here, you'll suddenly have, it doesn't matter what it's called, but you'll suddenly have like a weird like 0.js and 0.css file. That's actually that stuff. And there's, of course, a map internally in Webpack that knows that you know, this thing kind of maps to the 0.js or 0.css. Um, Oh, and so this is actually, I said this is not new, but that import syntax is actually um, something that you have to do, add something to your Webpack build for that to work. Uh, and it's just such an important thing that we just do it in the next version of Encore. 
We're like, let's just give that to people. People don't, you know, people don't care if they had to download like two extra things in their non node modules directory. Uh, let's give them that because it's really important. Um, so uh, putting all together, I'm going like, to show up a couple of best practices really quickly. Create one entry that is included in your layout. Uh, we're calling it app, and we're trying to kind of standardize on that a little bit so people kind of know what that means, but you can call it whatever you want. Um, treat each entry. Um, uh, as a page, that's a standalone JavaScript. So don't try to share things between your, your different entry files. Um, and organize your code into reusable modules, the same way that we do with our service files, and then kind of use them from your controller, that entry file. Um, so a good example of this is if you do your React, like uh, my entry file will be the spot where I actually like uh, import like my main React components, and then use React, uh, React DOM to render it. And that's it. It's like a couple lines long. And then all these other modules are like React components that use other React components that do all kinds of other stuff. Um, and of course, each module is its own uh, unique butterfly. So um, make sure that it requires everything that it needs, and it can it can actually work standalone. And make your CSS in the same way a dependency of your JavaScript app. Um, as far as the uh, jQuery stuff, you know, require jQuery like anything else. Um, even if auto provide allows you to, to cheat. The, the biggest thing I wanted you guys to see was how its, how its behavior changes internally. And that kind of clarifies a lot about how there aren't uh, global variables created when you require uh, jQuery properly. And use the new split entry chunks once we tag this release um, for your multi-entry uh, performance thing. If you only have one entry, you don't need this because it's just one entry. But if you do have the multi-entry thing, then use split chunks and it's going to kind of take care of things for you. And that is it. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> Um, I do have, I forgot to put it on yesterday, I do have, uh, there's joined in where you can rate all the talks here. Um, since joined in is such a long domain name, I decided to make a bit.ly link. And I feel like when you see a bit.ly link, you're like, ooh, I want to see where that goes. So find out where that goes. It goes to joined in, and then you can rate stuff. We also do have a, a screencast on Encore. It doesn't cover the last thing, the split entry chunks yet. Like, that's the new feature. Um, but it talks a lot more about this stuff. Uh, questions? I think I'm over in time, but. Okay, if you have any questions, you can tack. Oh, one question, and then I'll it. I did have a little comment, like where, uh, like, you can do multiple imports from one one file if you have like multiple exports in a in a JavaScript. File yes. In a, where you can de deconstruct the import. So that's something I didn't show, but yeah, like I always I always show it like one module exports one thing. You, this is the function this thing exports, and that's it. But you can actually export multiple things. It's, uh, it's only available with that newer uh, syntax, which is a good reason to use it. But yeah, you can actually export a function called A and a, a function called B and a function called C. And then when you import, you're like, I want to get A and C from that other file. Yeah, so you can do that. You don't, so it's, um, I don't do it that often, but like, you'll see it all over the place, and that's a really good comment. So if you guys have any other questions, then you guys can, uh, you guys can tackle me during lunch. Uh, do you have a, a best practice for uh, copying static to Oh, I forgot to put that in there. Yeah, because I knew that question was going to come up because I paid you to ask that. Really good question. Um, yes and no. Yes, yes. Um, there's, an, there's an incomplete thing that we're going to add to the doc shortly. So there is a, uh, there's a plugin that we recommend using uh, that just basically copies static assets to your public directory. Because the problem is, like, you can just, if you want to, you can just like, put your static assets in your public directory and then like, make an image tag in your template and point to them. But you know, we're trying to keep all of our stuff together, so that means we probably want to put our assets inside of our assets directory. Now, if you refer to an image from a CSS file, you're done. It's going to copy that for you and rename everything. The problem is, as you know, is that when you have uh, uh, like an image, and the whole point of the image is just to point at it via an image tag. Like on an in, in, from inside a template, um, so what people like to do is they like to put it in like an assets images directory, and then on have Webpack basically copy that to the public build directory, so that it's you know with everything else. So there's a copy plugin that does that, and, and we document that and we talk about it. The problem is that it doesn't support versioning, which is a real problem. So everything else is going to like have these nice version strings, um, and then your one image is not going to have a version string. So you're going to have to like to bust cache when you update that image. You're going to have to rename the image, which is annoying. Uh, and the reason behind that is um, just basically a couple of um, uh, node modules not working well together. Uh, we couldn't get so we, the um, basically the way we get that metadata to know about the versioning things is is via an external uh, library, and then the copy plugin is an external library, and like they just don't play well together. So we've kind of been waiting for them to play nicer together, and there's been some issues, and it just basically hasn't been solved. So we're going to solve this in one of two different ways. Either one, we're just going to basically write a, pl a copy plugin ourselves at some point pretty soon and just solve this because it's not that hard of a problem. The second thing is, and this is what I will, 
No, 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 no. I'll, t I'll tweet it after this. Um, somebody actually, I haven't tried it yet, so I can't think of the, if there's any going to be any issues with it, but somebody actually told me on Twitter like a month or two ago, they're like, oh, if you want to just copy a bunch of images from a directory, you can actually um, put this kind of this clever require code at the top of one of your entry files that more or less says require all of these images in this directory. Suddenly, that sort of has the same effect of uh, uh, referring to them from a CSS file. They actually end up getting moved into your build directory and they actually end up getting put in that map that uh, allows you to link to them in a version kind of way. So I'll, I'll tweet that and you can try it, but I have, to say, it's been, I have a Slack reminder I keep um, snoozing to the next day to like actually put that in the documentation. I'm gonna stop right there because I think I'm way over time, right? Yeah, I'm way over time, so you guys can find me afterwards. So thank you guys and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference.